So today I'm going to be giving you an introduction to the global burden of disease and talking about future directions for this, this study. So the key principles behind the global burden of disease are that we, des we believe that everyone deserves to live a long life in full health. So what we're measuring is the difference between that ideal and reality. And to also provide decision makers with a comprehensive picture of the leading causes of disability and early death across countries, times, sexes, and age, age groups. So this graph just shows you what we mean when we're talking about burden of disease or disability adjusted life years, also known as DALIs. So across the lifespan, let's say a person early in life experiences a road injury. They then don't die, but they experience a substantial disability that causes them great suffering. Later in life, middle age, they get lower back pain, diabetes, which also causes them to live a life in less than full health with suffering. And then they die early from a stroke, perhaps due to exposure to air pollution from vehicles. And they have not yet attained the maximum life expectancy that we see in the world. So therefore, when we talk about DALIs and burden of disease, we're measuring both uh, years of life lost due to premature death and disability. The Global Burden of Disease Study is quite comprehensive. We're looking at three, over 300 different diseases, injuries, and risk factors. It's just a huge study looking at 187 countries and 21 different regions spanning the years 1990 through 2010 and its current iteration, GBD 2010, and even 20 different age groups. So you can really get, in, you can get a very detailed view of disease patterns in different age groups. And in the Global Burden of Disease 2013 study that will be published later this year, we'll be adding even more diseases, injuries, and risk factors, and um, years. The Global Burden of Disease Network is very strong because of its collaborators. We have uh, uh, currently a, a thousand different collaborators worldwide, and we're seeking to add expertise. These experts contribute their knowledge of specific diseases or um, health patterns in a given country, and also they contribute, they help us identify data gaps where we may not be aware of certain data or they can provide us access to data that makes the study stronger. So some advantages of the global burden disease approach are that it provides this holistic view of health worldwide. And it's also more accurate and more rigorous than a, d a study of a specific disease. For example, back in 1993 when Christopher Murray, our director, and Alan Lopez <coughs> first started the, the Global Burden of Disease Study, and they were funded by the World Bank as part of the World Development Report, they sat down and, and counted how many different deaths occurred as I, and were, were calculated in these different disease-specific studies on things like malaria and tuberculosis, and they found that if you added them all up, people were dying four times over. So the global burden, global burden of disease is more rigorous because it says how many people are dying in a given year and what are they dying from, and there's not this risk of double counting of deaths. So I'd encourage you to go online and look at our data visualization tools. They're freely accessible. And this is just in one example of how you can look at countries um, in, in Asia. For males ages 15 to 49, you can see in the light blue that in certain countries, road injury burden actually exceeds that from HIV AIDS, violence, and tuberculosis. You can also use the, the, the tools to look at risk factor rankings across countries. So this shows in Nigeria and China how, what the, the risk factors are for premature death and disability. You can see in China, air, air pollution, ambient air pollution from all sources, not just um, vehicles, actually ranks fourth, and in Nigeria it ranks eighth. So for decision makers, they can get a very detailed view that can help them determine what interventions to fund with their very limited resources. So if I'm a policymaker in a country and I say, I want to see who's disproportionately affected in road crashes. Is it pedestrians, bicyclists, cars, or motorcycles? They can use these data to, to help shape their decision making. Going forward, the burden of disease study will be updated annually and is it will be a powerful tool for decision making. And we'll be incorporating new data every year as it becomes available and new evidence. So whether it be methodological <coughs> breakthroughs or um, new evidence, of, for example, about 
the effects of air pollution on health, we can, we can incorporate that, that new information into the results of the study. We can also use it to track health improvements over time and assess the impact of different interventions. Furthermore, countries can use this tool to benchmark their performance in health. Uh, compared to neighboring countries or compared to countries that are at a similar economic level of development. And finally, GBD is just a starting point. What we've shown you here is the country level results, but you can, use, you can use it to delve down to the local level to see disparities across your country. And for example, uh, the Institute for Health Metrics and the Global Bird of Disease Re researchers are collaborating with the Chinese government, the Mexican government, and even the UK government to look at health disparities at the local level. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>